We're going to be in Acts chapter 4 today. If you would please open your Bibles to Acts 4. And if you ever come in and don't have your Bible handy, there are some back there in the corner. Yeah, here's up here. Diana would like one, please. Good to see you all back today again. It's good to see Chris back there and the, the Millers. Did you all meet the Millers right here? Well, we're waiting for the Bibles to get passed out. So, uh, but, but when you come in, if you'd like to get a Bible, or if you don't have like a good Bible at the house and would like a Bible, I, I've said this quite a bit, but I'd like to say it again in case you're visiting, or even if you're watching at home today, if you need a Bible, please let our church know. We'd be delighted to make sure you have your own copy of God's Word. These ancient words, as we were singing that song, I was thinking ever true to help us walk as we walk through this world. Uh, I, I talked to someone earlier this week, and I said, I just, it was a lady going through some difficult times, and I asked her, I said, do you know the Lord? And she said, yes, I do. And that was so comforting, saying, you know, you're not alone. If you've got Jesus with you, you're never alone. And so uh, I want you to know that, too, is you're never alone, especially with today's lesson. Last week, we w looked at, uh, uh, I think it was Mother's Day, actually, but the week before, we looked at uh, how you, we're going to suffer persecution in this world if we stand up as Christians. And for many of us, we don't know that. And several months ago, we started praying for our kids because it's been growing on me, the increasing persecution against the church not only uh, in the world, but even becoming more and more here in the States. Uh, I talked to a pastor a week or so ago over, uh, over towards 45, and he was one of the Houston Five. You might remember a year or so ago, the mayor of Houston subpoenaed the pastor's sermons and said, we feel that there's hate speech in your sermons. We want to fine you if we find hate speech in your sermons. And the Houston Five, that's what they were called. They said, we're not going to give you our sermons. The, the thing kind of became, send him a Bible. Say, here's our sermons. Maybe they'll read it. But in any event, we see this. That was kind of unheard of, I think, when we see about how can the mayor of Harris County or the, of Houston tell these five pastors, we want to see what you're saying in church. We're, we may find you and cite you depending on what you're saying. I thought that was kind of outlandish right here in our community. And then you may have seen this week up in Canada, the pastor that was arrested on the side of the road. Uh, they sent like three or four SWAT teams on him or three or four squad cars. And it was because they had church. And he said, I'm going to have church regardless. And they said, no, you're not. We'll arrest you if you do. And they arrested him. And uh, that goes in, it kind of goes in line with our passage today, Acts chapter 4, and what I talked about two weeks ago and last week and uh, even a little bit with Mother's Day about suffering persecution in Timothy if we desire to live godly or if we speak godly. So in Acts chapter 4, hopefully you're there. We're going to read the first couple of verses here. Acts chapter 4 verse 1 says, as they, this is the apostles from chapter 3, they had, Peter had just given a sermon, and it said, as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, and being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. And Annas, the high priest, was there, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly descent. When they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, By what power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, If we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen. Amen. And uh, we, we see growing uh, persecution in the world, and we see growing persecution, I think, right here in the States, and right here in Texas, and right here in Harris County, and right here in Houston. And uh, I, I, was, I was interesting, I mentioned a few weeks ago that I think the House and Senate, they're in session right now, and they're passing a bill that there's uh, cities, and maybe I mentioned this a few weeks ago, I think I did, because churches don't pay property tax, and they said we can't tax them, their water bills are $1,000, $1,500, $2,000 a month. You know, more than the car dealer down the road, more than the golf course, more than commercial. They're saying, we're going to charge churches these rates so we can get money from them. 
in Magnolia, right here in Magnolia, Texas, one of those cities doing it. Their city council said, all the churches in our jurisdiction are going to pay X amount of water rates because they're fees, they're not taxes. And you see this ongoing, and now Austin actually has a bill right now specifically to tell jurisdictions you can't target churches uh, to, to do that. Now, the mosques, they pay regular rates. But the Christian churches, they said, we're gonna, you have to pay these rates for water because they're fees, not taxes. And when you see these things, it's easy to say, well, that's just, that's just, that's just. What it is is it's becoming soft persecution that will grow into aggressive persecution. And we sit quietly and don't say anything and just let it happen. And I'm saying, we see today in this passage where they spoke. Peter and the disciples spoke. Look at verse uh, 1 of chapter 4. As they were speaking... As they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came to them. Gideon made a very uh, observant thing today, and uh, we were talking about Luke 24, I believe, where the people that were evil came against Jesus, and these disparate groups that normally would infight, when it came against Christ, they united. The leaders of uh, Jerusalem, the leaders of Rome, the Roman uh, person there, Pilate and Herod, and all these different groups that normally had all this infighting. The moment they could attack a, Jesus, they did. They united against him. And we see here, it says the priests, the captain of the temple guard, and the Sadducees. Sadducees and Pharisees had some different views on things. And they would argue back and forth on stuff. But it says here that when, they, when the disciples were preaching Jesus and him crucified, we'll see that in verse 2 and 3, that united them. I have some friends in the Middle East that are Muslim, and they'll say, uh, you know, I'm Shia, and that person's Sunni, and our village doesn't like their village. And the only time we ever agree on anything is we hate Israel. That's when we unite, is to fight Israel. And you, you, you see these things, if you're spiritually minded, and you're looking at the world, you see what's going on there. They, they will unite with one another to attack Israel or Christians. And so here in verse uh, 1 again, it says, as they were speaking, before we get into too deep here, I'm going to real quickly go over John 15 through 16. I would encourage you later today to read this, uh, St. John chapters 15 and 16. And it says, Jesus teaches that we must remain connected to him. I am the vine, you are the branches. Remain in me and abide in me, because apart from me, you can do nothing. And then he goes on and says, because you're connected to me, Jesus, the world will hate you because of that. And that John 15 through 16, that specifically is in John 15, verses 18 through 27. Jesus tells his disciples, because you're connected to me, the world will hate you. And we are his disciples today. And if we're connected to Jesus and we're bold about it and we're open about it and we speak about it, there will be persecution come up against you according to the teachings of Jesus, which I believe. John chapter 16 goes on and says, uh, it teaches the power and the work of the Holy Spirit within us. And basically Jesus says, abide in me and stay connected to me, but because, because you abide in me and stay connected to me, you will be persecuted, but don't worry, the Holy Spirit's going to be in you and give you power to overcome that persecution. And then of chapter 16 of John, then Jesus says, these things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace, in the world, you will have tribulation. So all those two chapters there, Jesus is talking about, if you abide in me, you'll have persecution. Be of good cheer. The Holy Spirit's going to be with you. Stay with me. Don't worry. I've overcome the world. I've overcome the persecution. You'll be fine. That's an encouragement. Then John 17, of course, is the, holy, uh, the prayer of Jesus. When people say the Lord's Prayer, which they say our Father, that's what we're taught. But actually, John 17 is Christ's holy intercessory prayer for us. And he says, give them strength and protect them and hope that I, and I've not lost any of them and, and be with the sheep as I leave. Be with them to protect them and watch over them. And he's praying for us in John chapter 17. So as we see that in John, and we jump here now to Acts 4, it says, the disciples were speaking to the people, the masses, the people that are just there listening. And the priests and the captain of the temple guard, the temple guard was probably the highest ranking people there at the time. They're the ones that made sure there was order in the temple. And if something happened, they were like the security group. Uh, making sure if there was trouble, they would be there. They would quell it in the temple. They wouldn't allow anything to get out of control. So the temple guard was there, and the Sadducees came up to them. And they were greatly disturbed. Two reasons they were disturbed. One, who are these people that are teaching was number one. They were troubled by what they were doing, and they were troubled by what they were teaching. We're mad you're teaching, and we're mad what you're teaching. And if you read it, it says being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and... So they were mad right at the get-go because they were teaching. That's our job. We teach the people. You don't get to tell them anything. We control the masses. We control what they're told. That's kind of what was going on here. When you read this, it said they were disturbed because they were teaching, number one, and they were upset by what they were teaching. They were proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. 
Did you know that message in the world today, saying Jesus is the only way to heaven, and that he came back from the grave, and the only way we can come back from the grave and from hell and from damnation because of our sin is through Jesus Christ. Did you know that message in the world today is not well received? Uh, a few months ago, that guy that was here, Gary uh, Weatherall, I mentioned him last week or two, and I think I've mentioned this, we were in a village one night over in Lebanon, and had some guys with Hezbollah came, escorted us out of a city, took us to the city line, said, don't come back or we will kill you. That's pretty aggressive in your face, uh, uh, boldness by, by the, the powers of the satanic powers. Well, when they left, we did, I think I mentioned, we did go back that night. They said, don't come back tomorrow. So we went back that night, and we did share Christ in three or four homes that received us, and we went and said, we've got, a, we've got some gifts. We really would normally bring some food or some coffee or some stuff. It's hard for them to acquire necessarily. And then we said, we also have a story from the Injil. The Injil is the Matthew through Revelation. That's what they call it. We have a story from the Bible. May we share it with you? Yes. So we would go in and talk about the shepherd, and the good shepherd saves his sheep, some of those stories that they would understand and really connect with. And we told them, we believe that the way to heaven, the way to God, is through what Christ has done for us, what Jesus did for us on the cross. And that message was planted in those communities. Now, where that message is today, I have to stand on faith that God's word will not go out void, but it will accomplish that which he wants it to accomplish. And so those seeds were planted. We did leave that night because about an hour or two later, they came back, brandishing automatic weapons, pointed at us, get in your cars, leave, we're about to kill you. There was a guy named Mark was in our group. He's Lebanese, he's a Christian. And for, I'm not kidding you, for a half hour in the van, he just sat like this. I said, Mark, you okay? He, he said, I was so scared I couldn't speak. And he said, why would you Christians come from the other side of the world and come and do this in my community and I live here and I'm not willing to do it? And I said, well, Mark, I, you know, just maybe on your, your pathway. Well, I will report to you today, Mark has become much more bold because of the witness. Not that we're bold people, but we're bold in Christ. We were bold in Christ that evening. And that boldness gave Mark a position of, I can do that too. People are going to come from the other side of the world and tell fellow Lebanese, my countrymen, about Christ at the point of guns and weren't afraid and kept doing it, yet I'm right here and talk to these people and know the language and I'm afraid. That emboldened him. And when you become bolder in the Lord, it will embolden others. It will turn some people away too. No question about it. What was that? That wasn't me. <laughs> I don't know what that was. But in any event, see, there's proof. <laughs> we have sound effects. And so uh, it says they were greatly disturbed, and they were disturbed because they were proclaiming Jesus Christ. And, and that should not surprise us at all that that, uh, that message the world rejects. Verse 3. And, it's, and then what did it say uh, they did in verse 3? They laid hands on them. That's a euphemism. That's a euphemism for it got violent. Uh, it, 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 do you know that language? Yeah. Someone said, about to lay, I'm about to lay hands on them. That means it's, it, they seized them it, uh, it is a b better word. It said when they laid hands, it says they seized them. They grabbed them. They took control of them. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. So now what have they been put in jail for? Teaching Jesus. We say regularly here on Sundays, often we've heard the message from the youth and from the children's department, give them Jesus. It is so easy to say that in church on a Sunday morning with 200 fellow or 150 fellow believers or whatever we have. Very easy on Sunday morning to be bold and proclaim it. It's hard when you're out there in the highways and byways of the world. And that's what I want us to understand is we've got to have a boldness about us when we're out there alone, knowing that we're not alone. We have a church family. We have a cloud of witnesses surrounding us watching. We have angelic powers watching over us. We don't know what God's will is for us directly as far as physical safety, but no matter what happens, the worst case is we go to heaven. Worst case. Worst case, persecution, you go to heaven if you're bold. And they laid hands on them and they put them in jail till the next day. And we're seeing this play out right here in our own communities. The, uh, those Houston Five, those pastors here in Harris County, were threatened if you don't stop this hate speech, uh, talking about certain lifestyles, we don't care if it's in the Bible or not. You can't talk about it. And if you do, you may go to jail for it. I'm proud to say the five Houston pastors, the Houston Five said, then fine, we'll go to jail. We won't stop preaching God's truth. Amen. Yeah, and, and, but that's right here in Harris County. This was going on. In verse 4, it says, but many of those who heard the message believed. 
Does God's word, as I said a moment ago, does it go out and accomplish that which God purposes it to accomplish? And the answer is yes. I've told you that story of in the 80s when Reagan pulled all the missionaries out of Lebanon and that group of girls were there. 20, 30 years later, they've got a whole community of believers because one man in the late 70s, early 80s said, I'm going to go to Lebanon, I'm going to preach Christ and him crucified. Because of that one man, there's a whole community of believers that said, those nine or ten teenage girls that heard the message of Christ from the missionary that was here, and then Reagan pulled, after the Marine bombing, pulled all the missionaries out, all the U.S. citizens, pulled them out. Those girls that heard the message, believed the message, shared the message, and there's a community of believers, several villages now, that are followers of Christ, because one man said, I'm going to Lebanon to preach the gospel. God's word will go out and accomplish that which he purposes it to accomplish. The, when it says, we read a few weeks ago, that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Do we all agree that the gospel message has power? If the world's not being saved, or if people aren't being led to Christ, is it a failure of the power of the message, or is it a failure of the people not telling the message? Uh, that has really come to bear on me in the last several months, is it's never a failure on God's side. It's always a failure on God's people's side. We, we don't do the work. And so here it says, they went out, they heard the message, and they believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. If you study that word in the men, that doesn't mean mankind, it means the men. There's, there's two words there, anthropos and andros. This is andros, which means men, males, not just mankind. And the point being, there are 5,000 men received. How many women and children may have also? Could you imagine 5,000 men sold out for the Lord, teaching their families, raising their families in godly homes, what that would look like? Yeah. 5,000 men at one time heard the message, believed in Christ, and 5,000 men led their families godly in a Christian manner, Raise him up. Again, we didn't talk about it in Bible study today, but you were talking about Simon of Cyrene, and I love that story. I was going to mention it, but I thought I'd save it for now so you wouldn't know what I was saying. <laughs> but it talks about Simon of Cyrene, and of course, uh, that's on the, I would be kind of on the, maybe the northeast, northwest, northern area of Libya in Africa. That's where Simon of Cyrene was. That was biblical Cyrene. And when you look in Acts chapter uh, 16 and then Romans 13, it says as the, as the apostles, as persecution came and the apostles went up north, up to Antioch, where they were first called Christians, they found there group, groups of Christians already there. And they were like, well, how'd this happen? How, how did, how did we, we just got the message. We're the apostles and we go up 150, 200 miles north and we find other pockets of Christians already here. We were bringing you the message. Well, then if you follow that, Cyrene in the north of Africa, Antioch's basically the turn right where modern-day Turkey goes around Syria and kind of turns back over the Mediterranean there. That area, uh, and then in Romans 13, Paul says, greet Rufus and Alexander. Guess what Simon's two sons' names were? were? Rufus and Alexander. So when, when Simon of Cyrene picked up the cross, I believe at that time Simon probably saw what was going on and accepted the Lord. And I only base that on his two sons, and it says in all three Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it says Simon of Cyrene, and then in Mark it mentions his sons, Rufus and Alexander. Then you see Paul later saying, greet Rufus at the church. And so I tell you that to say Cyrene, which is on the north coast of Africa, and now way up by Turkey across the Mediterranean, hundreds, two, three hundred miles away, there's a pocket of Christians. I believe that's God's word goes out and it accomplishes God's purpose. I don't think Simon of Cyrene was coincidentally walking by that day. I think God had a divine purpose. And so you see North Africa then with the gospel. You see Turkey with the gospel. The apostles show up and say, how these pockets of Christians already get here? How'd the message get here so quick? Well, for the last two months, 50 days after Pentecost, I, I think that those kids were saying, hey, Jesus is the Savior of the world. Rufus and Alexander were the young men. Or maybe Simon was and said, hey, I've got to tell people this story. Jesus was the Savior of the world. He is the Savior of the world. I've got to tell somebody. But that message within that two or three month window from the cross to after Pentecost, 50 days later, somehow that message got 200 miles north. The only connection I can make through the Bible, just speculating, is Simon of Cyrene with his two sons, and they went north and told people the word. They, they became instant evangelists. Uh, and on the next day, now, now, so we saw the, uh, the groups already, the priest, the captain of the guard, and the Sadducees. So they put him in prison, 5,000... They, th th their persecution led these 5,000 people. I do believe when someone goes through persecution and stands firm on the Bible, that people that are watching that, it affects some of them and say, why would someone go through that for this message? They must really believe it. It, it is without question to me when I think of the apostles, and if you read about how they died and the persecution they went through, 
that they would say, we were just doing that and suffering death and suffering persecution on a myth. I think they believed it 100%. Many times I've told the story when I was on that rooftop in uh, Lebanon where they blew the school apart with the bombs, and that guy, Muhammad, said, do you believe this story? He had a Bible that we'd given him. He said, do you believe this? And, I, and to this day I say, if I didn't believe that book, I can guarantee I would not be standing on a rooftop in Lebanon that the building had been blown up. There was only one reason I was there, and it's because these people got to hear the message. And there was no one going over and telling them the message. So I said, we've got to get a group of us, six of us went, and said, we're going to tell them the message. And, and uh, so, yes, I believe it with all my life, and I hope you believe it with all your life. I hope you believe it with everything you have. Verse 5, on the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes. So a moment ago, we saw the priest, the captain, and the Sadducees joining together. Now, are there more groups coming against the message? Here's three more groups. So that's why I said evil starts, oh, what, there's someone doing something for the Lord? There's somebody uh, pr uh, praying? There's someone teaching about the Lord? There's someone teaching about Christ? There's someone teaching about salvation through Jesus Christ? Now we got to get involved. And so then it says on the next day, their rulers, their elders, and their scribes joined together in Jerusalem, and Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, Caiaphas was the high priest when Jesus was crucified, uh, Annas was his son-in-law, Caiaphas and John and Alexander, they were all of the high priestly descent. This was a family group, a very influential, powerful family that said, you shut up with this message or there's going to be trouble. They came up against them. So now you had the priest, the captain of the temple guard, the Sadducees, the scribes, the elders, the rulers, and an imp incredibly powerful family claiming religion that came up against them. In verse 7, when they placed them in the center, they began to inquire of the apostles, by what power or in what name have you done this? Now, there may have been a little hesitation by them saying, for these guys to be this bold, we want to make sure that Rome or Caesar or somebody hasn't sent them here. Because if we do something to them and they've got some kind of authority, we want to just kind of make sure what we're doing before we do it. I think that was going on. And interestingly, when Jesus and Mark, uh, I think, 14, chased the money changers out of the table, uh, chased the money changers out of the temple, do you remember the question they asked Jesus? The exact same question. By what authority and in whose name do you do this? Who gives you the power to do this? If they only knew who they were talking to. This is the power that said, let there be light. And there was light. That's the power that gives him the authority to do this. I told you some time ago, I talked to a lady and was talking to her about a story, and she had mentioned how Jesus wasn't very Christ-like <laughs> in some of his actions. And it's just mind-numbing to me that someone says, I'm a Christian, but Jesus wasn't acting Christ-like. Well, I don't even know how to respond to some, some of those things sometimes. He can do what he wants because of who he is. He's not defined by words. He defines words. He can't sin because he defines what sin is, and he doesn't do it. Everything he does is righteous. Do we believe that? Amen. He cannot be unchristlike. But to hear someone say, I'm a Christian and Jesus isn't Christlike is mind-numbing to me. And when they had placed them in the center, so they're all around them, do you think there was pressure put on them? They know two or three months earlier what happened to Jesus by the same group, by Caiaphas. And they've got the rulers the temple leaders, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scribes, the elders, the older men in the community, the inner power brokers, the circle that everyone knows them and they have power over the people to influence them. All these people are there. By what authority do you do this? How easy would it have been to say, we're sorry, won't happen again? Would that have been pretty easy to do? The answer is yes. It would have been very easy. Sorry, didn't mean to offend, won't happen again. We'll be quiet and go away. That's not, that's, I'm so thankful they didn't take that position. Here's what they did say. When they placed them in the center, verse 7, they began to inquire, by what power and what name have you done this? Peter, remember when Jesus said back in Acts 1, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will receive power. By what authority, by what power, in verse 7, do you do this? They're about to find out. By what power and what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with power, says to them, rulers and elders of the people. Does Peter know what could happen to him? Because what did just happen to Jesus two or three months before this? 
crucified. If we run, now remember we talked two weeks ago, this is the, the man that was brought by the gate beautiful, the guy that was lame since birth, that they walked by and he said, do you have alms, do you have some money, do you have something to give me? And they said, we silver and gold have we none, but we do have, we give you in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God who died for you. We lift you up, reached out his hand, pulled him up, and that beggar that was broken legs, couldn't walk, began to walk. And then it said he went into the temple and began rejoicing. And we'd mentioned two weeks ago how prior to that, because of his lameness, he would have never been allowed in the temple. They laid him outside the gate by the, the door beautiful, the gate beautiful. He was outside the gate. Once he had that experience with Christ, he was now brought into the temple, worshiping God, leaping for joy. And, and so they said, are you, are you bringing us here to try us for what we did for this man? Are you here to bring us for healing that man? Verse 9, if we're on trial for the benefit done to a sick man, this guy that was sick and broken and beat down, and now he's joyful and rejoicing, and he's worshiping God, if you brought us on trial for that, and you want to know as to how this man has been made well, is that why we're here? Are you asking by what power we have done this? Is this, this healing this man? Is that what you're asking? Is what they're saying? If that's what you're asking, then let it be made known to all of you. You, Caiaphas, who murdered Jesus, you, Annas, you rulers, you leaders, you elders, all you people, be, let it be known to you and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. By the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified. Boy, that's some boldness, isn't it? <laughs> he is facing potentially death from this group. And he doesn't bat an eye. He says, I'm going to be very clear exactly what happened here. What power did we heal this man? I'll tell you what power. By Jesus Christ, this, the Nazarene whom you crucified, whom God has raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. Jesus is the stone which was rejected by you and the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And, then, and there is salvation in no one else other than the name Jesus Christ, under heaven that has been given among men, whereby we must be saved. That is a boldness. And when you put that in context of what and where and the setting he was in, facing very likely death, had to have gone through his mind, this is Caiaphas sitting here, the one that, that pushed for the death of Jesus, and we may be next. But here we are 2,000 2, years later, and what story are we talking about? We're talking about these ancient words, long preserved for our walk in this world that gives us boldness and gives us strength. And if Peter, a man like you and me, who bleeds and has fears and sorrows and anxieties, can be this bold through the power of the Holy Spirit, so can we. We can be this bold. And we can say, I don't care what the world says. I care what he says. I don't care what I'm expected to act like in this world. I care what he expects me to act like. I'm not going to be conformed to this world. I'm going to be transformed. I talked to another man this week. Oh, I grew up in the church. I know all about the Bible. I've read the Bible probably more than you. I know more than you do. I don't believe it. It's just a, a book full of information. And what made me think was that verse was, it's not informational, it's transformational. It's not a book about information. It's a book to transform us. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. Become something new. Some people read it just as a book of information. That's it. The Holy Spirit hasn't opened their eyes. And maybe they're looking for that, that little bit of faith and a bold witness that will go to them and say, I believe this with all my life, with everything that I am, I believe this. I don't just believe the data on this page, I believe the facts of this page of who this is. Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, who has been crucified for the sins of the world, that was buried, the, the power of God raised him up, he's sitting on high today in heaven, waiting to come back to redeem us or to call us home, and I will be with him forever in glory. Do you believe that? Say Amen. And then he goes on to say, this is the stone which you have rejected. Folks, the world, this world system, and there's really only two beliefs about Jesus Christ. You believe he is the only way to God and he is the son of the living God, or you say he's not. I cannot believe there are a whole lot of people. There may be some still that haven't heard. I've come across people that said, I've never heard that story. They are out there. But they are a minuscule, I think they're getting a smaller and smaller group with technologies and mass communication devices. Fewer and fewer people can say, I never heard. Although the Bible talks about that too. How would they believe in a name they've never heard? How will they hear unless someone tells them? How will they tell them unless someone's sent? 
It's us, it's us go, go into all the world, teaching them, teaching in that word I mentioned several months ago, that word teaching, they're teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. That word teaching means with words. It means teaching them with words. Use your mouth to convey. Now, if you are a person that says, I just want to live my life such that people see the Jesus in me, I would hope you move beyond that level. I say that very lovingly and very respectfully. There are extremely good moral people in this world, and, they will, and, they, and they're not Christians. And if someone says, well, just look at that, but look how good a lifestyle he lives. I want, I want to copy him. That will not get someone to heaven. Saying, well, my, my life is the Bible, and they can just read my life. What, what does that even mean? Nowhere in Scripture it says, just be moral, and people will come to Christ because of your morality. That's not in there, because I know there's no good thing in me. They won't come to Christ through my morality. They need to know who I was before, who I was after, and what was the change. And that change was Jesus Christ who died on a cross for my sins and shed his blood for the covering of my sins. And if they don't hear that story and they say, well, I'm just going to live moral and I'm just going to live righteously. Because, for example, Craig Henry, as far as I know, Craig, I, I love you, brother. Righteous, most honorable man, righteous man. But if he says, never tells anyone about Jesus, I'm going straight to hell if I copy him. There's whole religion set up on be, just be moral. Do the best you can. And as long as you kind of are more good than, than, than bad, God's going to put it on a scale, and in the end, if your goodness outweighs the badness, you're going to go to heaven, and there's people who say, well, I can just be good, and I can get to heaven. No, they got to know direct revelation, not general revelation. There's a God. Many people believe that. Specific revelation, and he's got a son, and his name is Jesus Christ, and he died on a cross for your sins. If they don't get that message, when they die, they're going to hell. It's really that simple. And, and I've said this several months ago, God has one plan and only one plan to save the world. And the church is it. So often, I say, God, I, I just wish you here somewhere that says, when the church fails, I'm going to send 10,000 angels to tell everyone the truth. That's not in this book. The only thing this book says, I will give the church power and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. On this statement, the statement that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God, as we mentioned in Bible study today. On that statement of Peter, you are the son of the living God. On that statement is the statement God is building his church. Not his church built with physical hands, but the church built with spiritual hands. Who, on that building, I suspect on this building, who, who was here when this building was built that we're standing in? A bunch of y'all? Whether you were here or not, I know a building, there was someone that came out here with some transoms and some instruments, and they picked a spot that said, off this area, everything else in the building is going to be squared up on. Off this one piece of ground, this cornerstone, there's going to be the whole building going to be built, and we're going to start right here on this corner. And everything's got to line up on this. That's what it's talking about here. It says on this cornerstone, on that foundation, everything else in the church has to line up off of Jesus Christ, or it's going to be out of whack. If you set the cornerstone right here, and it's perfectly squared and leveled and even, and someone comes over here and says, well, I'm going to build over here somewhere, and I'm going to build over there, and I'm going to build this way, and I'm going to build, I'm going to build my way. I'm going to build with cardboard and hay and stubble. I'm not going to build with you know, uh, the right way. I'm not going to build with how Lord's up. I'm just going to build with whatever I want. I know. Did I just say the three little pigs? It just popped in my head. I see some of you giggling. I was thinking, what's they giggling about? Well, if they're building with, with other stuff that's not built on the, on the statement of Jesus Christ is the son of the living God who died for our sins and rose again. If it's not built on that, it's all rubbish. It's all garbage. And we have to be in alignment with that chief cornerstone. And that's what Peter tells them here is the chief cornerstone that you rejected. That's what God's building his, his holy temple on. And you've rejected that cornerstone. And you're out of whack. And everything you do is rubbish because it's out of alignment with the cornerstone that you rejected. That's what's going on in verse 11. And it said you rejected it, and that Christ has become the chief cornerstone of the temple of God. And then, of course, as I just read verse 12, because there's no name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved but the name of Jesus. That's it. There is no other way to heaven but through Jesus Christ. And if you're here today, if you're watching at home, today is the day of salvation. Don't put this off. I do want to read in 1 Peter, the same Peter who just said this. And, and uh, you remember uh, from Bible study, if you're here last week in Bible study, we talked about the denial, Peter denying three times. And then uh, the same Peter in 1 Peter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4, the same Peter in uh, 1 Peter writes, 
Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal which comes among you, which uh, comes for your testing of your faith. Do not think it's some strange thing that is happening to you. But to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. I'm going to encourage you to look at your own life and let each man and woman examine themselves. But if you say, I've got no joy in my life, I've got no joy of my salvation, I've got no joy, Peter ties these things together. Your willingness to suffer for Christ is the degree of joy you'll have in Christ. And if you say, well, I have no joy in Christ, it's just kind of routine, it's just kind of road, I just go to church on Sunday morning, I hear the songs, I have a warm, fuzzy feeling, I pray and I go back about my life all week. Maybe it's because you're not suffering for the cause. I'm not saying that. That's each person examine themselves. But in my own life, I've, I've looked at in the last several months, how much sacrifice am I doing for his kingdom? We don't like suffering. Nobody likes suffering. Nobody. Not anyone in the right mind anyway. But here Peter writes, to the degree, to the same level you share in sufferings, to that level you have joy. So I would encourage you to think, how much joy do I have in the Lord? Is it I put on KSBJ in my song, go into the grocery store and I sing along and that's the full extent of my joy? Because there's a whole lot more to salvation than that. There's a whole lot more joy that Jesus gives us and peace that we have in our lives than that. And I'm going to encourage you, if that's all you're just kind of taking a little bit, drink deeply of the grace that God gives. It's un unbelievable amounts of grace and love and care and joy that he pours out on us if we're willing to receive it. If you choose to live godly, you will suffer. If you're not suffering, as I mentioned last week, you can fill in the blanks for yourself. And I'm not saying go out there and just stand in the road. You gotta, you know, if you're suffering, speaking the truths of this book, speaking truth in your community, your community will reject you. And then Peter says, but don't be surprised. Uh, I talked to a lady this week. Her, name, her first name is Tracy. And she was going through some difficult times. And I said, you know, uh, I like those John Wayne war movies. I don't know if you all do those war movies. But I said, you know, when those bombers are over the target and they're dropping their bombs, their truth bombs, those are the planes that get the most flack. And I said, if you're catching flack, it might be because you're over the target. They don't shoot at planes 30 miles away. They shoot at planes that are over the, doing the work. I was reading another study this last about a month ago from George Barner that said in churches today, about 10% of people do the work, and it used to be 90% sat there and wanted to be served. But it says there's a growing group in churches in America today that the 10% doing the work, there's another 10% throwing rocks at the 10 doing the work. And there's about 80% that just kind of go through the church not really paying attention to what's going on. And, and I thought about that. Which, where, where am I in that? Am I the 80%, the 10% throwing rocks, or the 10% doing the work? I'm not saying that I've done that as my pastor, as your pastor of this church. I've done that as a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ. Today I saw Bob has a shirt on us. He's got it covered. But his shirt says, I'm not a fan of Jesus. And he said it starts a lot of conversations. He said, I'm not a fan of Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus. And there's a difference. I love the Lord for what he does for me. Do you love him enough to tell others about it? It's that next step. Are you a fan or a follower? And here's what Jesus said. If, if you follow me, pick up your cross and suffer with me. That's a follower. A fan is, oh, Jesus, thank you so much for what you've done for me. And that's, that's the depth of my salvation story. I'm thankful for what God's done, which is important. But you've got to go to that next level. You've got to go to the next level and be bold and share that story with people with words. And expect tribu tribulation, expect persecution. That's what Acts 4 and then 1 Peter that we just read. That's and John 15 and 16. I put all those together to say, that's what Jesus said. It's what's happening here right before our eyes in Acts 4. Uh, and then it happens in 1 Peter. Peter saying, this is what will happen. By, by the time Peter wrote Peter, do you think he knew the persecution? And the answer is yes. Back here in Acts 4, he, he may not know it yet. It's coming. He hasn't really suffered any. So far, all he's done is denied. Now here he's bold and he tells. But we know as he goes down, down the road a little bit through time, by the time he gets to writing First and Second Peter, he has suffered persecution by this point. It, 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 if you're going to be bold, you're going to get flack. But I love what he says in 1 Peter, don't be surprised. That just lets you know you're on target. Again, I mentioned a moment ago, and I'll say it again. If you're at home today or you're here watching or you're at home watching, I, I, I wish I had the words to tell you if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, do that today. If you're at home right now, a simple prayer, it's near to your brain and right in your mouth, 
dear Lord, forgive me. I love today in Luke 24, as uh, Gideon mentioned, the thief on the cross, and the thief on the cross, remember me today. It's not really the words that are said. It's that heart feeling of, God, I want to come to you through Jesus Christ and what he's done for me. And I know the only way I can come to you, I, the only way I enter that Holy of Holies, that we talked today, the veil was torn from top to bottom. The only way I can come through you is through what Christ did on the cross for me. And I believe that he died for me. And I believe the wages of my sin is death. And I believe that Jesus took that death for me. And because he took the death for me, I now can have eternal life through Jesus Christ. It's, that, it's really extremely simple. I actually just complicate it. It's, Lord, remember me, forgive me, a sinner. You mean that in your heart? Something that simple. We know that because of the thief on the cross. That simple. Remember me. Folks, I think we're getting in the end of the end days. Jesus said you're in the end days. That was 2,000 years ago. I think we're nearing the end of the end days. And I'm going to encourage you, don't wait to say, well, next week, next month, next year, when I finish college, when I get... I've heard people, when I get done with high school, when I get done with college, when I get married, when I have kids, I'll get, I'll get saved then. Don't put it off. Your eternal soul lands in the balance or lays in the balance. And you don't know that you have tomorrow promised to you. Not a person in this room has tomorrow promised to them. As far as being alive here on earth, if you're a believer, you have eternity promised. But if you're a believer here on this earth, you do not have tomorrow promised to you to be alive. We're all terminal. I talked to someone this week, and they said, well, I'm terminal. I said, I'm, we visited and prayed a little bit, and I said, you know, I want you to know we're all terminal. We all carry that genetic code of sin that we're all stage four in that way. We're all, this body, all of us will die. And, you know, I told that person, I said, I don't know. You may outlive me. I don't know. We don't know. We're not promised a moment. So I can't impress upon enough today that if you're not safe today, please do it today. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this message and for this boldness that, we sh that you share with us, these ancient words and these stories in here aren't just stories for our entertainment and information, but they're stories for transforming our lives into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, help us have the boldness as we go through these, these times that we're here on this earth. You may not come back for another thousand years, Father, but everyone in this room and everyone watching at home today we know we're going to meet you within the next 30, 40, 50, 60 years, one way or another. Help us to use our limited time here on this earth while we're in the, our physical bodies to boldly proclaim Jesus Christ to our community, to our friends, to our neighbors, to our family. Help us to have a boldness like Peter does here and just lays it flat out on the table. You rejected him and he, there is no salvation. I like how he closes that. There's no salvation but anyone else but Jesus Christ. As he tells them what they've done to reject Jesus, he then offers them the name of Jesus for salvation also in that same passage. Father, help us to have a boldness and to lead others to Christ or to at least be bold witnesses for you as your Holy Spirit opens their eyes and opens their hearts. Father, we thank you so much. Father, I thank you for the membership here at Autumn Creek and how, how much I love the brothers and sisters here at Christ that you've brought into my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.